When in March 2024, I launched my YouTube documentary, Aviators in the Afterlife, I went to some lengths explaining the significance of Leslie Flint's mediumship. He was the best known British medium ever to demonstrate direct voice phenomena. For example, the spirit of the pioneering pilot Amy Johnson, who died in 1941 while in the Royal Air Force, spoke through Flint 29 years after her death using her own voice and her message was recorded for posterity. This amazing facility that Flint had for the deceased to speak for themselves sounds crazy, but his biography asserts that he was never caught in fraud or ventriloquism. And if this man interests you, my aviator's video has more information. But please note that Leslie Flint's direct voice accomplishment was not unique. Another such medium was George Valentine, seen here, an American who featured in my 2020 documentary, Is Confucius Dead? The question being addressed was, did the voice of Confucius, speaking in an ancient Chinese dialect, come from Confucius himself, despite the passage of thousands of years, or is there another explanation? The Confucius story is an amazing one. Now I think I'd be failing you if I did not mention one more exceptional medium with this direct voice talent. Henrietta Wright, also known as Etta, was born in Oswego, New York State, in 1860 and lived for years in Detroit. She had a strong will, great independence of character and a sense of self-importance, believing in equal rights for men and women. And since she charged one dollar for a successful seance, she's regarded as a professional medium. For over half a century, with the help of her primary spirit guide, Dr. Sharp, Etta held sittings for thousands of people in the United Kingdom, the United States and Canada. He would open and close the medium seances and help visiting spirits to communicate. By having these visitors talk without Etta's own vocal intervention, she consistently mystified and impressed her sitters. Sadly, there are no recordings available, such as those available of Leslie Flint's seances. Dr. Sharp was aware that sceptics might regard him as simply a, a sub-personality of Mrs. Wright's own personality, but he insisted that he was an independent soul. Born in Scotland in the 18th century, he was taken to the United States as a child, and as an adult became a farmer and died in Evansville, Indiana. Seen here is a precipitated portrait of Dr. Sharp, produced by two mediums known as the Bang Sisters. Etta Wright paid $30 for this picture while staying at the Lilydale Spiritualist Colony in New York State near Lake Erie. She and the Bang Sisters were each holding seances there at the time, and if you want to know more about these strange sisters, you could watch my documentary, Forgotten Mediums, Part 2, which shows plenty of their materialised pictures. One client who became a close friend to Etta Wright was the former Canadian Prime Minister, William Lyon Mackenzie King. He sat with her first on the 24th of February 1932, by which time she was already 73 years old and suffering from a heart condition, although she still had a decade of life left. And on occasions thereafter, Mackenzie King would chat through her with deceased Canadian politicians and his immediate family. His interest in occult and psychic matters was so wide-ranging and bizarre that I'm currently making a documentary about this man. Another elevated person to sit with Etta in England was the Countess of Warwick, a former mistress of King Edward VII. The newspaper Psychic News reported on Mrs. Wright's visit to Warwick Castle for a private seance. On arriving at the castle, she went up to her room, and while waiting for her to come downstairs again, Lady Warwick noticed Etta's seance trumpet on the floor. I picked it up, she said, and immediately I heard the voice of my old friend King Edward talking in German. This happened when the medium was not even present but the Countess insisted, whenever I sat 
with Mrs. Wright, I always heard King Edward's voice and always in German. He was so persistent I got no other results, so I left off sitting. Incidentally, following the death of King Edward VII on June 22, 1911, he communicated at one of Etta's seances. This was when Etta had been in England for only three weeks, at the time his successor, King George V's coronation, was to be held. Apparently, five admirals were present at the sitting, and once his mannerisms had made his identity clear, they all stood up in respect for the former king. Etta Wright visited England on several occasions in 1911, 1912 and 1913. One reason for coming was at the invitation of the renowned newspaper editor W.T. Stead, who hoped that she would participate in Julia's bureau. This was Stead's scheme to allow bereaved people unable to pay for sittings with mediums to have them free of charge. The Julia referred to here was Julia Ames, Stead's American journalist friend who had died and with whom he remained in contact through his own automatic writing. Stead had established Julia's bureau in London in line with her wishes. Providing free sittings called for several competent mediums since visitors were entitled to three sittings with three different mediums and in its three-year existence around 1,300 sittings were given, with Etta Wright being one of the participants. She stayed in England for two and a half months initially, and she came again the following year. Stead's private secretary, Edith Harper, attended about 200 sittings with Mrs Wright between 1911 and 1913, claiming, she said, two, three or even four spirit voices may be talking to different sitters simultaneously using French, German, Italian, Spanish, Norwegian, Dutch, Arabic or other languages. In this case, the medium was unacquainted with any of them. Edith Harper also witnessed luminous forms gliding about the room in darkness and sometimes dogs materialised and barked. Running this bureau was expensive, costing Stead around £1,500 a year, equivalent to around £170,000 in current money. And the coordinator on the other side was Julia herself. As you may know, W.T. Stead drowned when the supposedly unsinkable Titanic ocean liner did sink on the 15th of April 1912 during its maiden voyage by hitting an iceberg. When Etta's spirit guides informed her that Stead had passed over, she hurried down to New York. The original idea had been for Etta to accompany Stead on his return journey to England. Instead, she witnessed rescued passengers disembarking from the Carpathia and she telegraphed to London, here to meet Stead, but he has gone. On the evening of April the 16th, Dr. Sharp gave full detail to the Titanic's collision and Stead himself communicated at these sittings over the next three nights, describing the tragedy and urging Etta to travel to London to still fulfil her engagement with Julia's bureau, which she did, arriving in England for nine weeks. One witness to this speedy post-mortem contact from Stead was Reverend Tweedale, a Church of England vicar and a spiritualist. Then on the 6th of May in London, Vice Admiral Osborne Moore, a respected psychical researcher, witnessed the deceased William Stead talking through Etta with his daughter Estelle for at least 40 minutes. He described it as the most painful yet realistic and convincing conversation that he'd heard during all his investigations into mediumship. On another occasion when talking of the Titanic, once Stead had ditched himself in the sea, he described having a short, sharp struggle to gain his breath, then immediately afterwards he came to his senses in another stage of existence. As you can tell, the William Stead story is sensational, which is why I made the documentary Sensational Stead and the Spirit World in 2018. 
In appreciation for her remarkable mediumship, and also in thanks for her work in Julia's bureau, Williamstead presented a gold pocket watch to Etta Wright. Originally, it had been given by Queen Victoria to an 11-year-old child, Miss Georgiana Eagle, and it was engraved for her meritorious and extraordinary clairvoyance produced at Osborne House, Isle of Wight, July the 15th, 1846. Many years later, this watch came into Stead's possession and he embellished it with a further engraving. Presented by W.T. Stead to Mrs. Etta Wright, through whose mediumship Queen Victoria's direct voice was heard in London in July 1911. Apparently, Her Majesty wanted Stead to bestow it on the medium of his choice, who had convinced him of life after death. As it happens, I made a 2022 documentary entitled Was Queen Victoria a Spiritualist? Despite this being interesting, it's been the most ignored of all my videos, but you can't win them all. In addition to the pocket watch, Mrs. Wright also received a framed address for her work with Julia's circle. We gladly and gratefully bear testimony to the extraordinary value of your form of mediumship, far in advance of any similar manifestations yet witnessed in this country. It seemed to be offering definite proof of the existence of a spirit dimension that earthlings could communicate with. And sometimes Etta also achieved materializations with spirit hands touching the sitters. Indeed, she was so successful in Britain that she chose to remain from April 1914 to September 1915, and with further visits in 1919 to 1922, 1927 and 1929. So what happened to Mrs Wright's gold watch? The answer is that as an elderly lady trying to clear up her affairs in 1938, she passed it on to the London Spiritualist Alliance four years before she died. On another occasion, Mrs Wright received a full-length oil portrait of herself seen here that she hung in her home back in Detroit. Again, the London Spiritualist Alliance acquired it towards the close of her life. And by the way, this alliance is now called the College of Psychic Studies. Without question, Etta Wright's most ardent supporter was this man, Vice Admiral Osborne Moore. It was because of his two books, Glimpses of the Next State and then The Voices, that she gained her deserved renown. For 35 years, Moore was a surveyor in the British Royal Navy, serving in the Pacific, China, Australia, as well as in home waters. And by the time he retired in 1904, he was in command of six survey vessels and being committed to exactness in his profession, he was suitably qualified to decide upon the authenticity of many mediums that he investigated. Wikipedia, however, which routinely distorts the truth about psychical issues, calls him a defender of fraudulent mediums and a credulous spiritualist. In 1903, in his book, the Cosmos and the Creeds more attacked the teachings of the Christian churches and doubted the possibility of existence in a post-mortem realm. He wrote that immortality, if there was any, lay in the influence people could have through their actions, words or writings on those who would come afterwards, that for himself he expected upon his demise to disappear forever. Later, however, in the glimpses of the next state in 1911, and after investigating dozens of mediums in both Britain and the States, he had misgivings about his agnosticism, as the book subtitle shows. Now, if it's Etta Wright's phenomena you're particularly interested in, then the sequel to Glimpses of the Next State is the more important volume. The Voices was published in 1913, and I'll come to it in a moment, but first let's continue with The Glimpses. And please note, both these books are available as free PDF copies. Glimpses on the website Ghost Circle and The Voices on Internet Archive. 
Before Vice Admiral Moore ever met Mrs. Wright, he investigated numerous other mediums, being aware that some of them had been charged with fraud. But there were more mediums than I can list featured in Glimpses of the Next States, and one remarkable aspect of this book is the sheer quantity of detailed notes he must have taken in order to produce its 672 pages. What is important, however, is that his investigations in America changed his attitude. He writes, I found the deeper I went into the study of spiritism, the more apparent it became that whether we wish it or not, man's individuality was not extinguished at death. His biggest mistake had been in trying to persuade others that his observations were not delusions. Sitters impressed by their experiences would next day think that they were victims of the medium's jugglery or from their confederate. And he noticed that hostile minds and negativity among the sitters led to no manifestations at all. One highlight for him was sitting with Joseph B. Johnson of Toledo, Ohio, whose image or photograph I've been actually unable to trace. He produced many materializations, including Moore's father and mother, in which he asserted there was no possibility of an error. However, Wikipedia assures us that Johnson was also exposed as a fraud. Despite that, however, at one of his seances, Moore observed 25 spirit forms materialised from the cabinet, being certain there was no trapdoor in the cabinet of any kind, and in any case these forms came out in all shapes and sizes. Some returned to the cabinet, Moore reported, while others, for lack of power, seemingly evaporated or dissolved into the floor. Although Moore encountered fraud among mediums, his view was that much of it was unconscious while they were in trance, and because he felt the Society for Psychical Research in London was too quick to dismiss some mediums as complete frauds, Moore left the SPR, referring to it afterwards as the Society for the Prevention of Research. Even after the many mediums he witnessed, Moore's conclusion was clear. The most gifted was Etta Wright of Detroit. Not that he saw her as perfect. The failure to obtain phenomena with Mrs. Wright affects about 5% of her sittings, he reported. If she does too much during the day, Dr. Sharp, her control, does not speak in the evening and no spirits manifest. But Moore did not see blank sessions or poor ones as evidence of failure, but rather as an indication of Wright's genuineness. So he decided his next book, The Voices, should deal solely with her mediumship. He investigated her in the United States in 1911, and then again in 1912 and 1913 in England, concluding for my part, I can only say that I obtained evidence of the next state of consciousness so clear and pronounced that the slightest doubt was no longer possible. But he also included this warning. In some cases, psychics, after many years, lose their sense of proportion and get to think of themselves as the gift and not merely the instrument. I earnestly hope Mrs. Wright will not be spoiled by the adulation of admiring sitters and if she tempted Dr. Sharp to withdraw his guidance, it would be a serious misfortune to the Western world. So now let's take a look at the voices. Yes, Moore witnessed her phenomena on multiple occasions, but so did Dr. John King, so did Sir William Barrett and Sir Oliver Lodge, as well as Arthur Conan Doyle and the Reverend Charles Tweedale and William Stead. That said, what did Moore himself specifically add? The answer is an extensive written record for the wider public of many of her most interesting cases. Here's just one example. If you want more, please consult the book. It concerns Count Cedo Majotovic, a Serbian diplomat seen here, and his Croatian friend Dr. Hinkovic, who attended a right sitting in 1912, held in perfect darkness. The medium reported the conditions as very good, so it may be possible to both hear and see some spirits. Quote, 
Here is the spirit of a young woman, Etta reported. She nods, she nods to you, Mr. Mayatovich. She whispers her name is Mayel, Adela, or Ada Mayel. Etta did not know that this woman had died only three weeks previously, being a very dear friend of Count Mayatovich. But she disappeared without saying anything. And then a light appeared behind the medium and drifted from left to right, as if carried by a soft breeze. This was not Ada Mayel, but it was William Stead in his usual walking costume. Both Mayatovich and the medium were delighted. And again also, when Stead declared that Ada Mayel wanted to speak with Mayatovich. This she did, affectionately, before an old friend also began talking to Dr. Hinkovich in the Croatian language, a physician who had died previously of heart disease. They conversed in their native tongue, and for the first time in her life, Mrs. Wright heard how the Croatian language sounds. Both Mayotovic and Hinkovic were deeply impressed by this seance, regarding it as the most wonderful experience of their lives. Later, Mayatovich arranged for Stead's friend, Professor Margareta Selenka, to sit with Mrs. Wright, enabling Stead to have a long conversation with her and a short one with Mayatovich himself, reminding him of an incident two years previously in Stead's office in London. Mayatovich's mother also spoke in Serbian. Then Selenka's deceased husband and her mother, who died a year earlier, both spoke to her in German. This was followed by a male spirit friend of Selenka who sang a German song requesting her to join him as they used to sing together in the old days. This was a truly remarkable seance by any standard. Like virtually all mediums though, Etta Wright faced claims that she was fraudulent. In one case, a Norwegian physicist, Christian Berkeland, seen here, snatched the trumpets from the seance floor to examine them. He claimed Mrs. Wright had created the noises from her trumpet by causing explosions using potassium and water and by using lycopodium powder. This, he said, explained the psychic movements of the trumpet. But as Admiral Moore replied, it's one thing to claim a chemical was found on the trumpet, but quite another to explain the evidential conversations that came through it. And Professor Barrett's opinion, expressed in Moore's book, was that this remarkable medium had given abundant proof that the voices and contents of the messages are wholly beyond the range of trickery or collusion. Otherwise, how can we account for this comment from James Robertson? He said, the voice of my mother was the voice I was familiar with, the same broad Doric speech as if she'd never gone from us. The Scotch idioms were never departed from for a moment. She spoke to me as if we had parted but yesterday. She called me Jeems, as she had always done while in the body. Mrs Wright could not by any possibility have given a replica of the Scottish tones that I heard, for while my mother was conversing with my daughters, the medium was talking in her usual Yankee tones. Now, if you find it a rather daunting prospect to wade through the 672 pages of Osborne Moore's glimpses, followed by another 470 pages of The Voices, there is another option. This book by the respected researcher N. Riley Hagerty, published in March 2024. It has the benefit of only 140 pages and includes the complete introduction to Moore's book, The Voices. This volume opens with the quotation, Nature has planted in our minds an insatiable longing to see the truth. A quotation new to me that comes from the Roman statesman and philosopher Cicero. And the author himself urges us to balance the facts of this evidence within the court of common sense. Well, I can agree to that. So now we come to the end of Etta Wright's startling life on Earth. In July 1942, she suffered a stroke, being paralysed in her left arm and leg, 
Understanding her serious condition, she appeared keen to pass over soon, but it was not until September the 14th that this happened. Her remains now rest in the Evergreen Cemetery in Detroit, but if the College of Psychic Science in London can be believed, that is not the end of the story. This report comes from their website. Once someone brought a sound meter into the college, so we thought it would be interesting to see what came up. We walked around the college, listening hard for unusual activity. Not much happened until we got to the portrait of Etta Wright. We stood beneath it and said, Hello, Etta. There was a moment's silence. Then there was a fizz of white noise in the meter, and then came an unmistakable hello, enunciated in a perfectly clipped American accent. Well, you can make of that what you like. I make no comment. But in the meantime, thanks for listening.